Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Andy's Witchcraft by me, Sacred Moon. I hope you're all having a wonderful week so far. Today's episode is going to be a very, very vulnerable one for me. It is going to be an update on an episode I released, I think, uh, a few months back. Um, the episode of my spiritual journey of sobriety. I'm going to link it below for those of you who want to listen, but just beware that the things I said back then and the things I say now are going to sound very different. Um, and it comes with having done shadow work and coming to the realization that um, I am an alcoholic. And uh, that was not an easy thing to come to terms with. Um, but I realized that I'm not alone and since going through the process of the 12 steps in Alcoholics Anonymous I realized there are a lot of people who can make use to this kind of story so I'm going to share a bit about how I found AA I'm going to address some misconceptions about AA and then I'm going to discuss how if you are like me and you are an alcoholic um, witch uh, how you can tweak the 12 steps into more of something for your craft. So, let's get started. Um, like I said, um, so how I found AA. Um, when I said I wasn't an alcoholic, that was me being in intense denial. Um, it, it very clearly was not just for spiritual reasons. It very clearly was something I was pushed to by my spirit team to do for my mental health. Um, and for about five months, I was what we were what we refer to as a dry drunk. This is a dr uh, an alcoholic who simply gives up alcohol. They don't go through the twelve steps. They don't do anything like that. They just give up alcohol, and that's it. The end. Um, in about five months of doing that, my mental health took a turn for the worse. Um, the grief of losing my best friend, the grief of losing my aunts. Um, and some relatives who passed away and it was a lot a lot a lot of stressors that came and on top of that um, experiencing the rejections of grad school applications and it was just it was just a lot and i felt stuck in my life and anxiety and despair kind of came over and the one thing i thought during these times were like man i need a drink and those words would replay in my mind over and over again for weeks on end um now, that's not very Buddhist of me, right? To have this attachment. And I realized that. And I never gave, cave in to those thoughts. But for the longest time, that was the only thoughts in my mind. Was I need a drink. I should drink. I should drink. I should drink. And it was very difficult. And it's, yeah. And it's that kind of symptomology that helped me realize that I am an alcoholic. Because I don't think it's a normal thing for you to think 24-7 I should drink. So one day, as I was lighting a candle for Lucifer, um, something in my mind pushed me to download a day counter app. Uh, for me, seeing tangible evidence of my progress motivates me that I should put, push forward and keep going. So I thought, why not? I downloaded the app and I set up an account. And interestingly, this app was something you can make posts and connect to al other alcoholics. It's sort of like an Instagram for alcoholics, I like to think of it as. And as I explored the app more and I made some posts and I reached out, to people and made a small community I found that the app even had a link to virtual AA meetings and these meetings run 24 7 which is fantastic um, at the time I had no intention of ever going to a meeting I still denied being an alcoholic at this point um, I just thought that this was an attachment right like like in, in Buddhism we believe everything's an attachment I attach myself to people I attach myself to financial stability I attach myself to my future career aspirations and I thought alcohol was just one of those normal attachments that make us human um, but one day something told me to go to this AA meeting log on the app click on that zoom link and log on and go on there and just listen and now I know that that's something with Lucifer and Kali yelling at me but that's a story for another day <laughs> um, they very much pushed me into my sobriety um, and so I went to the meeting and I listened in and I kept going to these meetings for weeks on end because I really resonated with it, um, with the cravings and the desire to throw away a life of mindfulness and peace just for a moment of relief by drinking. And for about a month of meetings, I still denied being an alcoholic. I just thought I was a normal person who just didn't want to drink anymore. And eventually, 
um, that kind of thinking got me to slow down on going to meetings because I was just quote unquote too busy to keep it up and um, I, I wasn't like them and I didn't feel like one of them and all that and then um, this is when Kali really came in with full full force um, she joined my spirit team back in October and then by um, December she really really pushed me to keep doing this um, she told me go to more meetings and basically the conversation that I have in my mind with her was like why do I have to do it I'm not them I'm not an alcoholic like, like why do you want me to do this and then all of a sudden you know I'd hear her or I'd see her candle like flicker and like I just shut up and do it and that so whatever I did uh, I went to more meetings after I lost my job back in December um, I really pushed myself to to go to more meetings um, I went to one pretty much almost every day and when January hit, I made a, a resolution to go to a meeting every single day and I have kept to that. For So it's almost been two months of me going to AA meetings every single day. And that was just, you know, a big turn for my, for my sobriety. And I realized that I am an alcoholic. Um, and just because my story looks drastically different than, than a lot of alcoholics does not mean that I'm not one. So... I found a sponsor, um, my first sponsor back in November, and I still didn't think I was an alcoholic, and I didn't take the steps seriously, and I refused to make more time for meetings or to call her, and it didn't really work out. Um, my next sponsor, the second one I had, she didn't have time to really connect with me and to make sure I was working the steps. I felt like I was doing it on my own, so I kind of told her, like, I need to find someone else who can make more time for me. At least for check-ins. Um, and so I, I was very lost at this point and the cravings were still worse. But I kept going to meetings and I kept connecting with what we call a sober network, which is a community. Just your, your small like quote-unquote friend group. We don't necessarily have to be friends, but we're like each other's support in our sobriety journeys. And so I would connect with them. Now I have my third and hopefully final sponsor <laughs> but he has really helped me he has changed my life for the better and he helped me come to the conclusion that yeah I am an alcoholic and that's okay and it's okay to have this label um, and it's nothing to be ashamed of what we should be ashamed of are the poor decisions we made during our active active addiction phase but to be an alcoholic in of itself that's nothing to be ashamed of um, and all of this was really worth it. And you know what? My whole spirit team played a role. Buddha told me to give up alcohol. Yahweh supported it. Jesus supported it. They told me to love myself more. Um, and I really wasn't loving myself with the, with the way I was, I was drinking, for sure. Um, Lucifer pushed me to download that app. And Lucifer and Kali both pushed me to go to AA meetings. So like to see my spirit team work together for the betterment of my sobriety, that has helped me so much. And I felt so, so much love from them. And all of it just, you know, it hits me hard. Uh, I'm grateful for them. Am I still, am I grateful to be an alcoholic? I'm not there quite yet. I hope to be someday, but today is not that day and that's okay. But I, I do know I'm grateful for my spirit team. They are my higher power. They love me. I love them and they want the best for me. And that is all I ever wanted was for someone to care about my well-being enough to say, you deserve better. So that's my story of how I found AA. Um, now to address some kind, common, kind of common misconceptions. Um, about AA. Um, the first one is, is AA for Christians only? Is it a Christians only group where we just preach about the word of God and that's it, the end? Absolutely not. Contrary to what people think, AA is not an all Christians club, but historically speaking, it, it did start out that way, honestly, I found. Um, I found that, yeah, the, the people who founded AA, one of them was an atheist slash agnostic. It's still not 100% certain, but because of it was a group effort to start this AA process, the majority were Christians. And so the vocabulary in the big book 
that we follow that talks about the 12 steps and stuff like that is very Christian oriented. But now the more variety there are of people who come in, the, the more we're changing the vocabulary a, a bit. Not changing the whole book, but just the vocabulary. Um, the point of AA is to live a sober life by following the 12 steps, which include believing in God as we understand him or her or them, whatever. There are alcoholics from all religions and even atheist alcoholics, and their definition of a higher power can vary. But it doesn't, and it doesn't even need to be a, a deity of any sort, right? So the key part of this is as we understand him, her, or them. Um, who, whatever God means to you, and place that with higher power. Whatever higher power means to you, that's your higher power. It does not have to be the Abrahamic God. If the AA group you're in pushes their religion, religious beliefs on to you, run, because that's not a real meeting. Um, but in all seriousness, if one meeting doesn't work out, there are tons of others to try because each individual group is different. That's the key part. We have different members, and so different members mean different people running the meetings, which means different rules, which means different topics, and all that jazz. Um, so don't give up. If one group doesn't work out for you, definitely keep looking. Um, and the question a lot of people tell, ask me, ironically, is can you even be an alcoholic and a crystal pagan Buddhist? Especially the Buddhist part. People are like, how can you be an alcoholic Buddhist? Like... Buddhism says you should not have any attachments. You literally have an attachment to a drink. So how, how can this be? And some even tell me I'm not a real witch because I'm an alcoholic, because I have this disease of the mind. And they tell me I'm not a real Buddhist because I'm admitting to attachments. And so my whole spiritual identity is totally like shaken from this. But I, I've learned to ignore these people and push them to the side and say, and the kindest genuine way possible, please get educated. Because alcoholism is a disease of the mind. It's similar to depression, to anxiety, or any other mental health issue. It can be managed, but it can never be cured. And just because I have this disease that can never be cured does not mean I am any less of a spiritual person. Um, in fact, I would argue I'm even more spiritual because I'm literally following these 12 steps that tell me that I need to be spiritual, that tell me I need spiritual healing, not physical healing, not even emotional healing necessarily. So we're talking about spiritual healing, healing and connecting to the divine. So that's what I have to say about that. Um, and yeah, uh, those are kind of the common misconceptions that AA has that's most popular I find I'm sure there are tons of more tons of more tons more but uh for now like that's that's just what I'm gonna stop there because these are the two misconceptions that affected me the most I found now for the final part of this episode I'm going to talk about how I incorporate crystal pagan buddhism concepts into the steps um, but before I start, I, I kind of want to make a disclaimer about witchcraft and addiction. Um, there's no simple spell that's going to cure you from an addiction to alcohol or smoking or any other substance that's taken over your lives. When in doubt, you got to consider mundane over magic. You got to do your shadow work, possibly go to therapy, go to meetings, um, work whatever program works best for you. You can do spells, obviously, for motivation or confidence to help push you to do these steps but as for a cure you're not gonna be able to do that like you're gonna be waiting a lifetime for your spell to work to cure you of um, addiction the ultimate goal of these steps is a spiritual transformation like i've said and these transformations don't come about without an understanding of prayer and meditation and again shadow work Literally, the entire thing is shadow work, which kind of explains why Lucifer pushed me to go to AA in the first place, because he was helping me with my shadow work, and he noticed that I wasn't doing it. So he's like, you know what? When in doubt, I'm going to push you to, I'm going to take you someplace that will make you do your shadow work. Um, and yeah. So without further ado, let's get started on these steps, shall we? The 
first step in our 12 step program is that we admitted that we were powerless and that our lives had become unmanageable because of alcohol. Now you're going to ask yourselves, you're going to ask yourself in this step, number one, have you admitted that you're an alcoholic? Have you swallowed your pride and admitted that you are different than normal drinkers? Have you accepted the fact that you're going to spend the rest of your life without liquor, uh, lest you um, fall back into addiction? Do you have any reservations or ideas in the back of your mind that someday you'll be able to drink safely? And are you absolutely honest with yourself and with other people regarding your addiction? So what does it mean to admit that you are powerless? Because that's a very broad concept. Um, and powerlessness looks different to everyone. We are powerless not because we, we are without power or ability. It's just because we have lost the means to put the power within us to use. That magic that is within you, that power from your higher power um, is within you and you lost touch with it. That's kind of like the general spiritual meaning of powerlessness. Now, you may have already caused a great deal of damage to yourself or to people around you, and, but here in step one, you're going to recognize that the wreckage is there. You're not going to look at specifics. You're not going to think of specifics. You're not going to ruminate on, oh, I did this and this and this and this and this and I'm a terrible person. No, you're just going to say alcohol made me do shitty things that's it that's all you have to do as a buddhist um step one is a crucial step for me um, because buddhists have to acknowledge any attachments that they have in order to be able to let them go and by going through step one i am beginning to say yes i have an attachment and i don't want to be attached to this anymore i do not want this to take over my life so it started my journey of detaching myself from these cravings and the need to intoxicate myself to cope with life. It started the journey of practicing acceptance. This is a thing I still struggle with. Um, I hate that I can't control certain things. Right now, I hate it. And I that that's going to take a lot of work to change that mindset. But this is the start of my journey towards acceptance um, and to do what's best for my recovery. In the first and second noble truths, the Buddha taught us that life is full of suffering and that ignorance, delusion, and cravings are the cause of our suffering. Our addictions trapped us in this vicious cycle of suffering beyond our control and that it, it, it made us less mindful. And according to the Buddha's teachings, this cycle begins with ignorance and delusion. And so to overcome this, you have to say, yes, I have a problem. You have to overcome that ignorance and that delusion that no, my drinking is fine and I'm a fine person and I'm not an alcoholic and I'm going to drink normal for the rest of my life. If you're a normal drinker, great. That's fantastic for you. I would never wish this disease upon my worst enemy. But if you are an alcoholic, that mentality is not going to help you. As a witch, um, here is a ritual that you can do to help you through step one. And oh, as a disclaimer, any specific rituals I talk about in this video, uh, I'm going to put the name of the book. I got it from below. Um, it is an excellent book for pagans in recovery and I absolutely love it. Um, so yeah, that's a disclaimer. That's where any of the ritual ideas come from. It's that book. So yeah. All right. Now let's talk about this ritual. So the book suggests that you go to a natural place where you can be in contact with the elements. So this could be a stream, a shallow river, an ocean, a lake, a mountaintop, in a field, you know, anywhere. Just make sure it's as natural as possible. When you found your place, stand in that space and will nature to stop doing what it's doing. So if you're in a stream or ocean, Tell water, stop it. Stop doing waves. And if you're on a hill or in a storm, stop the wind or the rain. Just say stop. Okay. Did that work? No. <laughs> this is not something our will alone can control. And I, I, and I want, and 
the book and I want you not just to intellectually understand it, but experience it. Experience how does it feel to want to will something to be the way you want it and for it not to be that way. Think about this, journal about it, reflect on it, you know. Now stand there for a time and tell the earth to change, you know. And, and do these random things, you know, tell the birds, stop chirping, tell, uh, you know, whatever else you could think of, uh, the bees to stop buzzing, uh, you know, all that. Uh, does it work? No. And if you keep doing this, you're going to recognize that the powers of the earth are not at your command, at least at this moment. And the same goes for your addiction. It's not something you're going to will away. So. That is step one. Now let's talk about step two. Step two of AA is to, that we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Now, this personally was an easy one for me. I always believed in a higher power. I believed in Yahweh. Um, even when I was an atheist, I, I believed that the universe and nature were a power greater than I could ever understand and that they had control of things that I did not. Um, so when I came to AA, I had zero issue with step two because this is only the belief. You don't have to say, make my life better. You don't have to connect with that. You don't even, yeah, you don't even need to connect with a higher power at this point. You just need to believe that there is something greater out there. Um, for those of you that are kind of freaked out by this, don't let this step scare you away. Like I said, your higher power does not have to be anything related to the Abrahamic God. Don't let your religious trauma stop you from making a decision for your sobriety, okay? Um, just believe that there's something out there. There's something greater. You know, something put humans on this planet, whether it's the Big Bang or not. Yeah, the Big Bang could be your higher power. That's right. <laughs> you know? But... A word of caution I kind of want to say because I, I'm telling you this stuff. I'm telling you it doesn't have to be anything related to the Abrahamic God. But if you attend enough meetings regularly, you're going to hear religious speeches and prayers. And, and that's it happens. That's how the program started. And that's kind of how it stayed over the years because it's what's worked. Um, but AA is made up of humans who sometimes forget the whole principles of our personalities and sometimes they're going to ignore individual differences and opinions and focus um on their religion and that's it you know um but uh for the most part they nobody's going to push their religious beliefs on you at least at the right meetings you go to um and in these moments when when they're when they're saying the our father or when they when they're saying the serenity prayer and they're using the word god or when they're saying the prayer of saint francis just try to remember that this power greater than ourselves um when, when they when they refer to the word god it's only that's for christians to others it's going to be zeus or odin or venus or hecate or asherah or any of the numerous deities that exist for others it's just going to be the big bang or earth or the universe, or the stars, and the moons, and the galaxies, whatever it may be. When you hear a Christian prayer, you can kind of recite your own prayer of your own version um, to this. You can write your own prayer and say it in these moments. Tune out whatever you don't resonate and just focus on what you do resonate with. Um, for me, uh, I have many sources of higher powers, but I only worship two two of them. I worship Yahweh and Asherah as uh, the father and mother. Um, my spirit team are also part of my higher power, though, which includes Jesus, Mother Mary, Saint Joseph, Lucifer, Buddha, and Kali. Um, they've all been fantastic. They've all been integral to my sobriety. So I'm going to keep working with them on this. They are my higher power. They help me when I can't help myself. That's what a higher power does. So whatever higher power means to you, find ways to connect with them um, or at least find ways to show your belief in them. Um, in Buddhism, the Buddha taught in the third noble truth that there is a way to transcend our cycle of craving and sufferings and it's through his teachings. 
Um, the Buddha's teachings will, over time, lead us to a deep personal insight into our interconnectedness with a power greater than ourselves um, that is not separate from ourselves. So Buddha literally says there is something greater than us out there and we are all interconnected. We're connected to each other. We're connected to the earth. We're connected to the universe. And that's literally what he says. And I freaking love that because that is always what's been my belief. And so his teachings have definitely helped me through the 12 steps. So now I'm going to talk about a ritual for step two. So the book that I got it from says to find a forested place away as much as possible from the sounds of the city. Sit where you could see the sky and the trees and whatever other wildlife may be visible. And then start to meditate on what force it might be that keeps each of these creatures sustained. So when we look at pollution and hunting and human civilization and construction and all that and animals getting hit on the roadway, why don't these creatures despair and diminish? Why? You gotta kind of reflect on that a bit. These animals seem to have faith, some sort of faith, in the faith that they will endure um, and that whatever struggles they face is going to be worthwhile because they're still here and alive without knowing who is providing it. Like, like animals don't have a concept of a higher power, so they don't know who's providing this, but they have faith and they keep going. You don't, you know, you don't hear a lot of stories of animals, um, taking their own lives or anything like that. So very clearly they have, a, they, they, they see some purpose, even if it's just anima animalistic. Is that the word? Yeah. <laughs> um, but we can also have this faith, you know, we can have this faith that we're here for a reason and that we can keep going and that we should keep going. And we don't need to know what or who this higher power is. We just need to, again, believe that it exists. So stay for a while in the quiet of nature and experience all of this and let the trust that all of nature has permeate your own being. And when it's done so, thank nature for sharing it with you. And at this point, you can leave an offering or thank the gods and goddesses of that place for showing you nature. Um, uh, you do whatever resonates most with you. You could do a cleansing ritual, whatever that jazz. And I want to finish off step two with some Bible verses that can help you kind of remind you of this belief in a higher power. So I'm not going to read the entire verse like I usually do. I'm just going to tell you the, the, the book and the chapters and the verses you can find them from. And you can read them yourselves at your own leisure. So we have Genesis chapter 2 verse 9. We have Genesis chapter 9 verse 3. We have Job chapter 12 verses 7 through 10. We have Job chapter 38 verse 41. We have Psalm chapter 104, verse 21. We have Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. We have Matthew chapter 6, verse 31. And we have Luke chapter 12, verses 27 to 28. Now, let's talk about step three. This step says that you have made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of the divine and our own highest self. Now, the of the divine and our own highest self actually comes from that uh, book about pagans in recovery. Um, the wording, again, is more of the care of God as we understand him, I believe, is the original version. But I really like this wording for the sake of this, this episode. So that's the wording I'm going with. Um, and so... This is the part where you make the decision to turn your life over to the deity or higher power of your own choosing. And again, step three is nothing but a decision. So it's going beyond the belief. And now you're saying, you know what? I'm going to trust this deity. I don't trust them yet, maybe, but I'm going to. I'm going to make a decision and an agreement between me and my higher power. And they're going to restore me to sanity. It's basically making a pact or a deal. And when that deal is successful, that's going to vary between individuals, but that's basically what you're doing in this step. In the book, uh, the big book that um, alcoholics read through and follow um, 
kind of like our version of the Bible, essentially. It's the Bible for AA, essentially. But there's a prayer. I'm going to read it because I'm a crystal pagan Buddhist. I love this prayer. I say it every morning and every night. I have it memorized front and back. I could probably recite it backwards if I tried. <laughs> so I'm going to read it to you guys now. Um, and so the third step prayer is, God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. And of course, the pagan book I got has a modification for you guys if you don't resonate with the word God. Um, you could kind of replace the word God uh, with whatever name you want. Uh, sacred Universe. The, the book gives the example Blessed Bridget, uh, Mother Hecate, or Mother Lilith, uh, Father Lucifer. Yeah, like, you know, there, you could just replace, replace that name and that's it. The point of this prayer is to say that you have a purpose beyond yourself, okay? And, and, and that higher purpose speaks of hope and even an expectation of victory. Um, and that victory is the freedom of the bondage of addiction. For my atheist witches in the room, don't worry. You don't need to turn your life over to a deity. You could choose your own higher self as your higher power. So the person you want to become, that's your higher self. Um, and basically, it's who's the person that you want to be spiritually and what is your higher purpose. Um, one prayer or mantra you can say instead of that third step prayer I gave was, do what thou sh wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law, love under will. I found that that was a pretty uh, pretty good, good one to share. But again, no matter what or who you believe in, when your higher power helps you, they are not going to do the work for you. They're going to give you that push, that assistance, but you have to put in the rest of the effort. As Buddhists, uh, we take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, which are called the Three Jewels. Um, and we kind of talk about the oneness with the universe and the true nature of all beings. Um, and when I say uh, the Dharma, the Dharma is basically the teachings of the Buddha, which is like the path to recovery. Um, and the Sangha is the Buddhist community, so local or worldwide, um, and just the Buddhist Recovery Fellowship. So taking refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha basically means that you're going to turn to the three jewels not only as a shelter from your craving, um, but also as the light to guide you through the darkness of ignorance and delusion. So now I'm going to finish off step three with a little ritual from the book. So it says, imagine you see a stream over which is a narrow makeshift bridge. The bridge you picture is solid enough to support the weight of two people safely and wide enough to have stable footing. When you have pictured this bridge, imagine that you are blindfolded and the individual next to you, whether it's a deity or a higher self, is helping you uh, lead you over this bridge. You are entirely dependent on this being um, so that you do not fall. Once you have imagined yourself being led across, picture that you remove the blindfold and cross again with your own eyes. You may notice that there is still a small fear of falling, or maybe you won't. Depends on how active your imagination is, I think. Um, but recognize now that when you were blind, you could not cross safely under your own power. You needed that power greater than yourself. When the blindfold was lifted, you could see again, and you were able to cross under your own power. I love that ritual. I find that it connects me to my spirit team. Um, sometimes I, I take turns with who I imagine is helping me across the bridge. Uh, and it, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a heartwarming uh, kind of feeling, I think. So now let's talk about step four, which is when we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. 
Basically, in step four, you're going to take a close and detailed look at who you are and who you've been, uh, what your motives were in doing uh, certain things. And uh, you have to be honest, okay? Uh, you have to be really honest in this, and it's going to be painful, but it's going to be worth it uh, in the end. It's basically about integrity, right? It, what's the point about doing this step if you're just going to bullshit your way through it? So... You're going to write basically a list of what we call defects of character. And uh, what are these defects of character, you might ask? They're basically the not so great things we've done in our life. And it could be because of your drinking or be just in general because of other life circumstances. Uh, anything you believe will affect your sobriety, especially with feelings of guilt, is great to put on this list. Um, examples I have lift, listed here, basically like the seven deadly sins, quote unquote, like lust, gluttony, greed, sloth, wrath, envy, and pride. Um, breaking the Ten Commandments, although, you know, I Ten Commandments is very, you know, subjective belief, especially when you've worked on deconstruction as much as I have. Um, but especially acts that have harmed yourself or others. Um, uh, the Wiccan Reed states, uh, consider the potential harm to every individual who may be impacted by your actions. If there is no foreseeable harm, you are free to act with liberty. If, however, there is any potential harm, then you must weigh that harm against the good that will result from your actions. Then act with that knowledge and be prepared to accept the consequences, foreseen or unforeseen, from uh, your action or inaction. Now, I may not totally agree with Wiccan's origins, and by that I mean I hate the origins. It's got a lot of roots in cultural appropriation and racism, but I do love this explanation of harm, so that's why I kind of put it there. Um, on your step four, you're going to write resentments you've held on to or struggled to let go, fears that you have that stop you from being your best self, and basically anything else that you can think of. Um, this step, spiritually, is going to comprise of one, shadow work. This is the parts of yourself you do not like. The roots of these parts and what you can do to better yourself. Which again, totally explains why Lucifer pushed me to do AA in the first place. Um, you're also going to want to write some gratitude lists because writing a bunch of shitty things you've done is not fun. So, write gratitude lists. Write a list of things you like about yourself. So, strengths list. Again, you're going to practice humility. So... And, and I love this in, the, in, in that pagan book I talk about, I'm going to keep referring to, they say there is no true humility in being unable to recognize our own positive traits. Um, so like any talents you may have, any strengths you may have, your character, so personality traits you like, you want to recognize these things to be humble. The Buddha even taught us that our thoughts, words, and actions have an effect on our own lives as well as the lives of others and on the entire world. The law of karma that Buddhists believe in states that we do indeed participate in the creation of our own lives and our recovery is deeply dependent on acknowledging our actions do matter and sincerely taking ownership of the consequences of our actions so we can transform our attitudes, behaviors, and our lives. So now I'm going to talk about the step four ritual in the book. I was wondering whether to include this or not, but I really like it. Um, I feel like it's, it's a great thing to practice humility. So basically, instead of looking within yourselves at like the your character defects, you're going to you're going to focus on the outside for this one. So stand in front of a mirror. OK, and you could set some quiet music up if that makes you comfortable, light candles, whatever you want to, to feel comfortable. But you're going to stand in the mirror and you're going to ask yourself, one, why am I dressed the way that I am? Two, what does the way I dress say about me? Three, am I trying to send a message to the people around me? Four, is what I'm wearing congruent with who I am? And five, do I like the person I truly wish to be? As you think about these questions, you're going to write down the answers and any other thoughts that come to mind. You're going to recognize that each article of clothing is not only covering you, but it's also hiding you. So you're going to ask, what you're hiding 
if you're wearing a certain thing, what do you try to hide with, with the clothes you're wearing? We all have insecurity. I wear baggy uh, I wear baggy sweaters. I wear size extra large sweaters, even though it's way too big for me because of my top dysphoria. And I like to hide that part of me. That's, that's what I would write down, for example. But still, take the time from head to toe, you know, focus on your hair, your eyes, your nose, your shoulders, your curves, your thighs, stretch marks, whatever. And you're going to you record each detail and how you feel about it and what it means to you. And do not write only the negatives, but also write the positives. The book says, if you don't have just as many positives as you do negatives, something is missing in your inventory and you are not done. Go back, stand in front of the mirror and do it again. <laughs> um, but yeah, so... That's basically, the, the book goes in way more detail, but I don't want to waste time talking about that. I highly recommend you get the book if you're interested. But yeah, basically take your inventory on your physical appearance. And that makes it easier to do a deep dive on what's inside of you. Now let's talk about step five. This is when we admitted to deity, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Um, again, the word deity that has been replaced based on the pagan book that, I, that, that have been read, that I got this from, it, it does replace the word God, which I love. And it just shows how easy it is to tweak the big book. So in step four, you made an inventory. In step five, you're going to read that inventory. You're going to read it to yourself out loud. You're going to read it to your higher power. And you're going to read it to another human being, which is terrifying to go through this list three times, but <laughs> it, you could kind of do uh, yourself, like admit it to yourself as you're doing step four, like when you're writing it down the first time, so you don't have to reread it. Um, that's fine too. But basically you're putting all that stuff in the public. The, again, you want to be completely honest. Don't hide things don't skip over things when you're telling another human being you know be honest so number one let's talk about admitted to deity many of us believe that the gods know our hearts that they already know what we've done that they're um omnis omniscient is that the word yeah <laughs> um but and because of this some of us may think it's unnecessary like why do i need to confess to them all these things if they already know i've done them but the truth is, it's not even for them. It's for our own benefit. It's so that they know. It's so that we can show that we are truly remorseful for the shitty things we've done, especially during our addiction life. Um, and so that's why it's really crucial to do this. And it's easier to start with a higher power than with another human being because your higher power is never going to judge you. Well, they may chastise you a bit or they may be like, Oh, you stupid idiot. Why'd you do that? You know, but it's all in good fun. It's all in humor, right? Um, so that's always the easiest to start with, I find. Then you have admitted to yourselves. Um, again, you want to go over this list and you don't want to shame yourself for the things you've done. So you're going to read through the list and you're, try you're going to try to push away the shame and the guilt. You're going to be like, I accept that this is the way I acted in the past. And I'm also accepting that I'm going to do better for my future. So that's the importance of admitting it to yourself. It's so you know what you need to improve on to be your best self. And finally, we have admitted to another human being. Christians do this step all the time when they go to confession. But what I really love about this step, especially as a crystal pagan Buddhist, is that you don't need to go to a priest specifically and confess your sins. You just need to tell a human being. That's even the argument. Like Christians, you know, they say, why do we need confession? And, and they, the, the church's explanation is because you need to admit to another person to show that you're truly remorseful. Okay, I'll admit to another person. I'll admit it to someone I trust. Um, who says that has to be a priest? Jesus didn't say it has to be a priest. So... 
Again, this could be any human being at all. Some can go to a priest and that is fine. If you trust your priest, go for it. But you could also go to a friend or a family member or even your sponsor. And that's what I did. I went to my sponsor because you know what? I trust him with my entire being. He has shown me time and time again that I can trust him and that he cares for me and my sobriety. And that's who I'm going to turn to. Those of us who are looking to do step five, you're not going to look for absolution. You're not. You're not. You're going to just take accountability. And whether the person, if, if you go to the person you harmed to confess your wrongs, whether they forgive you or not, that's, you know, that's on them. And we're going to talk more about that in step eight. But, you know, sometimes the person you trust is the person that you hurt. So sometimes it's kind of like doing both at the same time. But the point is, again, you're not going to look for absolution. You're just going to be humble and tell the truth. The Buddha during his lifetime even created a ceremony called, oh man, how do you pronounce this? <laughs> Uposatha, I think that's how I pronounce this. But basically, um, it comes from the word Upavasatha, which is a Sanskrit word that means cleansing of the defiled mind. And basically in this ceremony, Buddha um, admits to Sangha members the nature of their unskillful or unwholesome thoughts, words, and deeds. And this confession is going to bring them closer to enlightenment. Uh, and that's basically what step five is all about. So it's really, really interesting to see how people do the 12 steps and even people who aren't addicts do the 12 steps. Like Buddhists do it anyways, regardless of their addiction. And Low-key, I resent the fact that I had to wait until I could admit that I'm an alcoholic to be able to do this. Um, but hey, I'm here now, and that's pretty damn fantastic. So, yes. And basically, for your step five ritual, essentially what you're going to do is you're going to do step five, but you're going to practice by telling it to your deity, and that, that that's basically it. So you're, you can do some divination, you can grab a statue or a painting or an image of your higher power, and you're just going to talk to them and tell them everything on your inventory and listen as well to what your deity or higher power has to say. And listen to any signs, notice any symbols, especially if you're outside and let's say, oh, I said this, I, you know, I said uh, I stole my sister's cookie, for example, and then the wind gets stronger. Like, what does that mean to you? What do you think your higher power is trying to tell you in that moment? Um, and you're going to do that for all the whole inventory, the entire thing. Um, doesn't matter how long or short it is, just do it. Um, and that's basically your step five ritual, quote unquote. That brings us to step six. We're halfway there, folks. Uh, we were entirely ready to affect, with the help of deity, a profound change in our character. Um, basically, it means you're going to recognize that you're not able to change your character with willpower alone. Such changes need to be done with the help of our deities or higher self. Basically, this step can involve prayers or letters to your higher power to assist you in removing the defects of characters that you want. Again, this isn't the actual action of getting rid of these defects. This is being ready. This is a preparation. This is about readiness. And this is about who do you want to be in the future. And this is about desire. So what you have to want to want to change, if that makes sense. Want to want to change. And it can't just be a casual admission saying, okay, God, I'm ready. No, no, no. You have to be serious about it. You need to express it with honesty, sincerity, and feeling. You have to say, God, I am ready. This is why. I do not want to live this way. I do not want to be trapped by the bonds of addiction. And help me. You know, you want to go into details. You want to say why you want the help. And the Buddha taught the principle of nice kramya. Nice gramia, which is a Sanskrit word that means renunciation and freedom from craving and clinging. So while we prepare to be transformed, you have to be willing to let go of your unwholesome qualities and allow your greater power to transform them into wholesome ones. This Buddhist doctrine means not only renouncing our unwholesome characteristics, 
but let go of control over the process and not trying to manipulate the outcome. And man, this calls me out every time because Buddha knows that I'm struggling with this. Buddha knows and he does not give a crap. He's like, you're going to do it anyways because that's the way you're going to be enlightened. Now, the step six ritual, this t is titled A Day of Mindfulness. Yes, that's right. This is going to be an entire day long. So choose a day for yourself where nothing else is planned. Your day off of work, your day off of school, whatever, no babysitting. Maybe you don't have kids in the house. Your kids went out with a relative, your spouse, your boyfriend, whatever, your girlfriend. Doesn't matter. Plan a time where you have yourself. And... The goal of this ritual is to be mindful that willingness is required for each and every action that you perform. So you're going to wake up and you're in your bed. You're going to be mindful that the action of rolling onto your side to silence the alarm needs willingness. You need to be willing to press the button and to choose which button to press, whether you snooze or whether you end the alarm. <laughs> Um, and as you go about your day, you're going to keep doing this and you're going to be contemplative. I choose to move my right leg first over my left. I choose to eat breakfast and satisfy my hunger. I choose to pour myself a cup of coffee. I choose, I, I have willingness to play some music and to dance around in my pajamas all day. Um... I am willing and, and I choose to wash the dishes, starting with the plates and then moving on to spoons and forks and cutlery or whatever. And you're going to keep doing that all day, all day, all day. And you're going to examine that willingness. What does it feel like to have control over this and to choose to do something? And what does it look like for you? And as you go about your day and you practice and you notice your willingness and you take notes and you journal, once the day is finished, you found that the pathway to willingness is not through fate. It's not through chance. This is something under your own control. Your actions are ones that you can control. You can't control what other people do to you, but you can control what you do to other people, what you do to yourself. And at the end of the day, maybe do a meditation, maybe do some jour more journaling, maybe draw. Um, and then at the end, you're just going to go to bed and just contemplate on that the whole time. So I plan on doing that ritual. I'm actually on step six right now. So I'm very, very nervous. Ah, but uh, yeah, it took me a long time, a lot of back and forth. I think so far the hardest step for me was step four. Um, so that's, a, that's my experience, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> so now let's talk about step seven, where we humbly implored deity to help us affect that change. This is the true, like action step kind of thing where we like look to the deity in humility, strength, and confidence and say, please furnish me with the strength to change my inner nature in accordance with my highest will. Um, and a Bible story that, that very, very much shows this in action comes from Mark chapter 9, verses 14 to 29. And basically, a man was imploring Jesus to heal his son. Jesus said that if the man would but believe, his son would be healed. And the man was concerned because Jesus' disciples couldn't help. They couldn't heal uh, his son. But he still thought that Jesus would be able to. And so the man said to him, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Um, and basically, you want to be like this man when you're doing your step seven. Um, that Bible verse, I love that Bible verse. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Um, it, it, it helps. It, you want to strengthen your faith to do this step. It, it requires a lot of faith and a lot of patience. Um, a, a very much pagan version of this it goes if that which thou seekest thou findest not within thee thou wilt never find it without and so you want to know that while the assistance to change our lives exists the willingness and the power to overcome this stillness exists within us alone so again 
your deities can help you they can assist you but your strength has to come from yourself you have to put in the effort to make this change it can't come from your deities alone um, you need to ask and you need to know that change is possible and that if you only you have the willingness and the strength for that change you can do it and we need to be cooperative with it our deities are not going to change us unless we want to they're not for us you know doing things against our will they can tell us oh you should do this like lucifer can tell me all day long you need to do shadow work you need to do shadow work but unless i do my shadow work it ain't gonna happen <laughs> um and you know that's that's exactly what they're there for just to give us that push those reminders when we struggle with remembering ourselves uh, the Buddhist doctrines teach us that everything we encounter, including ourselves, has absolute no permanent identity or characteristic. Change is inevitable. It's unavoidable. And so when you think I'm stuck like this forever, no, you're not. It's not forever. Maybe not in this lifetime you'll be able to change, but maybe in the next or the one after that or the one after that. You know, I believe in reincarnation and I believe we will find a way in one of these lifetimes. And that's what this change is for. We're not special in this world. We share the same universal nature with all sentient beings. Um, and I believe that includes deities. We have, uh, like in Christianity, we have the Holy Spirit within us. I have Mother Ashra within me. I have Yahweh's strength in me. And I have Ashra's compassion and kindness and sometimes patience maybe not towards myself but i like to think i have patience for others um and that's the buddha nature that buddhism kind of speaks about it's who we are it's it's this connection with the universe especially our deities that compassion that can restore us to sanity and so at this step in step seven many buddhists do say this atonement prayer um, and it's a way of asking their unwholesome and unskillful characteristics to be transformed into positive ones. So this is another one that's really good for anyone that doesn't really align with Christian uh, prayers or anything like that. You could simply say, all evil karma ever committed by me since before time because of my vast greed, anger, and ignorance. Born of my body, my mouth, and mind, I now atone for it all. May it be transformed for the good of all things. So what kind of witchy things can you do when you're doing this step? Well, again, you want to do things to help you implore the deities to help affect that change. So I do my spells with my spirit team. I could do my spells. And examples of spells that I typically do with my, with my spirit team that that usually help me with, with the 12-step program, especially our kind of cord-cutting rituals to relieve me of attachments, self-esteem spells, self-love spells, confidence or assertiveness spells, protection spells, manifestation spells, all the spells. Um, these are things that I do to connect with my higher power. Um, I also do divination. That's just a way to communicate and be like, you know, are you willing to help me affect this change? I want to change. Can you help me? So any form of divination or communication or prayer um, is huge at this stage. And you could totally tweak that however you want with your spirit team. Next, we have step eight. This is when you make a list of all the persons uh, you have harmed and become willing to make amends to them all. So this is a process of recognizing what we have done to others. And Basically, the goal of this is to de develop a sense of empathy towards them and be willing to do something about it to better yourself for in the future. So like, again, you're going to think back to kind of like the step four stuff, but rather than resentments you hold against yourself, um, you're going to think of things that you've done to harm others. So like, do you, have you ever demonstrated the seven deadly sins towards others? Have you, you know, any of the Ten Commandments, you know, committed adultery, cheated on your significant other? Have you ever um, stolen from someone? Have you ever assaulted someone? Have you ever, you know, taken money, fraud, and all that stuff? You know, you're going to think back to those. You're going to think back to every single person, basically. And 
depending on how old you are, I have 23 years of this to make up for. So really, I have a lot of amends to make. Um, but basically, it's a huge thing because when you suffer from addiction, you have definitely caused unnecessary harm to others, uh, whether we like to admit it or not. And yeah, the temptation is there to just let sleeping dogs lie. Why dredge up old wounds? Why dredge up, you know, past uh, mistakes and stuff like that? But really, if you are holding on to guilt or if they're holding on to guilt, you need to bring it up again to be able to let it go. And again, the key part here is to focus on your intention. If your purpose for making amends is just to show, oh, I have changed, I'm better now, I deserve respect and I deserve forgiveness, you're not ready to make amends and hold back on doing this step until you can overcome that mindset because you're not doing this for your own gratification. You're not doing this for you. You are not. You're doing it for your sobriety, yes, but you're not doing it for you. It's not about forgiveness. It's not about, it, it, it's not about anything like that. It's about humility. It's about becoming an honest person, a better person than we were when we were in our active addiction. Pagans typically claim to have a reverence for nature, right? So nature can definitely be one of those things you've harmed. Have you ever littered? Uh, have, have you ever additionally caused pollution? I keep my, sometimes uh, I want to go on my phone and so I pull over on the road and I leave my car running and I, and I, you know, I cause additional pollution. I could turn off my car, but do I want to? No, I'm too lazy for that. You know, these kinds of examples. And so you could definitely consider starting with making amends to the earth for, for things you have done to harm her. This, this beautiful planet that has protected us and that has held all life. And, you know, you want to make up for that because she deserves more respect than that, right? Um, and so you want to think of ways to offer amends. Maybe give some offerings. Maybe pick up litter rather than add to it. Maybe start bike riding more often. Maybe... Uh, reducing your meat consumption, you know, um, all these kinds of things. Maybe start your own garden, plant flowers, you know. These are all things you can do to make up for the harm we have caused our planet in the past. According to Buddhist teachings on karmic law, our intentions do give rise to our karma and actions. And from our actions, karmic seeds arise and they ripen them into karmic results called vibhaka which is a Sanskrit word meaning ripened fruit. Desirable vipaka is the result of skillful and wholesome actions, but undesirable vipaka is the result of unskillful and unwholesome actions. So our karma is continuously being regenerated by our current actions, and it is entirely possible to reshape future karma through the choices and actions that we embrace and carry out today. Buddhism teaches us that we can purify negative karmic seeds through four purifying powers. So the power of regret, the power of promise not to repeat the action, the power of repair or making amends, and the power of remedial actions and service to others. And when you look at these, that's part of the 12 steps. That's basically the 12 steps condensed into four. You know, the power of regret, that's your fourth step right there. Writing down things that you have regret, things that you fear. The power to promise not to repeat the action, that's letting it go to your higher power. That's, that's step basically five and six there, telling the others so that you don't make the same mistakes. And the power to repair and make amends, hello, that's this step right here, step eight and step nine, where you're talking about making amends. And then the power of remedial actions or service to, uh, to others, we're going to talk about that a lot in step 12. So really, it's so, so cool to see how this entire time I was practicing, I was learning about Buddhism and I'm trying to be a Buddhist and be mindful um, for the sake of, you know, my enlightenment and the enlightenment of others. And all this time it was right in front of me in the 12 steps. And if I had only admitted to myself sooner that I was an alcoholic, I could have had this and I could have had a much easier time with this. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's just amazing. So anyways, like I said, in this step, step eight, and also in the next step, step nine, we're talking a lot about the power of regret, and we're talking about the power of promise not to repeat the actions. And this is when we set the intention uh, to make amends, right? To repair that 
what we have caused. So let's talk about a step eight ritual that you can do um, to be a little witchy while doing the steps, right? So you're going to get a large piece of paper and you're going to construct what's called a tree of influence. Now, this is like a family tree, but instead of moving back in time, you're going to move outward uh, in relations. So you're going to draw a circle and you're going to write your name in that circle. Okay. Then you're going to draw a bigger circle around that. And that's your immediate family. So those living in the same house as us. And you're going to write down names of people that you have harmed in your immediate. Then you're going to draw another circle and it's going to be people a little farther related than you. Maybe your friends or your coworkers or students if you're still in school, you know, acquaintances. And then you're going to keep making bigger circles depending on how distantly related you are. Not just related, but distantly connected to these people. So it's totally going to look a little different uh, for everybody. But basically, yeah, that's what you're going to do. Then you're going to look at this paper and you're going to spend some time in meditation and contemplation and you're going to think, you don't need to write it down yet, but you're going to think about what you have done to cause each of these people harm. And you're going to, again, think about how you influence those people. So not just, oh, I, I hurt them, but how did this harm affect them? So. I lashed out in anger at my sister once and she told me I was just like my dad and this caused her to trust me less. And it wasn't until I was able to overcome this anger, which I'm still struggling with, but it wasn't until I could recognize that my anger was becoming a problem that I could heal that, that I could build that trust again. So again, you're not just going to think this is the harm, but you're going to think of the consequences of that harm towards not only yourself, but the person that you harmed. So anyways, after you look at this paper and you think like that, the way I gave that example, you're going to get a container large enough to fit your paper in and you're going to put the paper in water in, in that bucket or bathtub or whatever. You just put it and then you're going to take some drops of like food coloring or whatever and you're going to put one drop in the center and you're going to watch the ink spread over the paper and see how far it goes. Then you're going to add another drop and another drop and just see how it spreads and connects. And now this is going to be symbolic. That food coloring or whatever um, is the harm you cause. And so you could see how you cause harm. Not, you, you put the dot on yourself, you cause harm on yourself, and it's still affecting others. Um, and the reason that I consider this to be a witchy way, again, it came from the pagan book. So like the, the, the pagan recovery book. But uh, the reason that I love this is because you can connect with your, your spirit team and talk with them as you're doing this. And also you could do spell to kind of help relieve that, that guilt you feel from harming others. Um, you, can, you can do that. And it, it's totally... Oh, definitely witchy. I, I would, when, when I plan to do this, I'm going to light some candles. I'm going to do divination. I'm going to, I'm going to look at this and then I'm going to do a tarot poll and I'm going to work, talk to my spirit team and we're going to work through this shit and I'm going to not be hard on myself. And I'm not going to say, look at all the harm I cause. I'm a shitty person. They're going to help me work through those feelings because I'm not a shitty person. I've done shitty things, but I'm not a shitty person. Excuse my language. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so especially when it comes to actions you did in your active addiction. So people you've harmed, did you ever like steal money to go buy alcohol or, you know, did you ever, uh, get drunk and hurt people while in that, in that rage? Did you ever drunk drive? That hurts people. There's, there's tons of ways, but you, again, you can also think of how you harm people in general. I, I, I would add to my list people that I have harmed before my, my uh, addiction. Um, back in grade school, I still think about them and I hope they're doing well. So now that you've come up with this list of people that you've harmed and you've contemplated on how you harmed them, step nine is where you make that direct amends to people wherever possible. And the key phrase here I want to add is, except when to do so would injure them or others. Now, what is the definition of injure? That's going to vary. Um, so 
there there's tons of examples in the big book the the book of alcoholics anonymous there's tons of examples there um it could be physically injuring it could be psychologically injuring like i'm i'm gonna add people to this list from grade school but i'm not gonna reach out to them because i know hearing from me is going to cause them all kinds of distress and i'm not going to cause someone distress just because of my own you know this is for my sobriety i have to do this for me like no i'm not going to cause undue harm for me like that's the opposite of what we're trying to do in aa <laughs> so it, it definitely depends and definitely as you're doing these steps which you should be doing with a sponsor i forgot to put that out there you should be doing this with a sponsor not alone please don't that this is a very difficult process to do alone but uh your sponsor can help guide you on whether you should or shouldn't if you feel questionable like oh i don't know if you know this might bug them or whatever but again yeah it's not a, it, and the, you may still feel guilty after doing this because it's not only about eliminating guilt it's just about making amends so that others realize that it was not their fault because a lot of times we hurt people and they feel like it's their fault and it's not and so making amends can help them realize that the Bible has tons of verses about making amends that you can find, but a few of them that I will list are Matthew chapter 5 verses 23 to 24, Matthew chapter 18 verses 21 to 35, Mark chapter 11 verse 25, Luke chapter 6 verse 37, Galatians chapter 6 verses 1 to 2, and 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 19. And like I said, in this step, we are going to, we, we engage in the power, the purifying powers of Buddhism of the power of repair and the power of remedial actions, where we transform ourselves from being a person that avoids taking responsibility to a person that takes responsibility for our actions. And so we confront the reality that we are imperfect and that's okay. Everybody's imperfect. We're all that way. And we make mistakes and that is okay but we want to avoid the making it in the future. And if we're stuck in our guilt and our resentments, we're not gonna change. We're gonna be even worse. In meta meditation, um, we hold a person in our mind and recite phrases like, may you be safe, may you be well, may you be happy, and may you live in peace. And so Buddhism is all about meta medita meditation where you're wishing kindness on someone. Um, and that's a big thing, especially, especially if they, the person also hurt you in return, because we hurt people, they hurt us and it happens. And sometimes we make amends and we expect them to make amends with us and they don't. And that's okay. All we could do is just wish, you know what? Let it go. I wish you the best. I didn't do this for you. I didn't do this for me. I, I did it, you know, for the sake of restoring karma kind of thing. So when do we need to make amends based on Buddhism? Um, Buddhist, Buddhists rely on the five moral precepts and these precepts were taught by Buddha as a guide for his lay disciples. Um, and basically, if our actions are outside of these principles, then we probably need to make amends. So the five moral precepts are one, I embrace the teaching of loving kindness. I abstain from harming others. Two, I embrace the teaching of generosity. I abstain from taking things not freely given. Three, I embrace the teaching of respect for all beings. I abstain from sensual misconduct. Four, I embrace the teaching of mindful communication. I abstain from deception and discord. And five, I embrace the teaching of mindfulness. I abstain from substances and actions that lead to intoxication and heedlessness. Now that one called me out big time as an alcoholic. Like, thank you. Thank you for reminding me that I couldn't abstain from substances and that I used them to avoid my problems. Thanks, Buddha. <laughs> but in all honesty, it was it's good to be called out sometimes um, to help us overcome these kinds of mindsets. So now I'm going to kind of discuss some step nine prep spell ideas. 
Um, and, and, and this idea came from the book, as always. And uh, I liked it a lot. It, 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 it doesn't necessarily help you with step nine, but it helps you prepare for step nine, which is why I called it Prep Spell. And essentially, the book uh, suggests you make amulets, um, basically to encourage um, the feeling of being courageous and brave. Um, and this is important, I find, because step nine is not an easy step. It's not easy to go up to the person and say, I am wrong, or I was wrong. So, but going up to the person and doing that, you're going to need a lot of courage. And what's the best way to that? Well, that's when I said spells are good for this. So you can make an amulet. And there are many, many ways to create an amulet. And the method that you choose will be up to you, of course. But my top three choices are always, number one, enchanting jewelry using your preferred methods. So like charging it in the moonlight or the sunlight or spray, spritzing some water on it if it's like the water resistant jewelry. Um, but yeah. Uh, two, making a sachet of crystals for courage. And I like to add a little bit of herbs in there as well. Um, I've been doing that a lot lately and I found that it was really cool. Um, and then three, making a spell jar for courage or forgiveness and carrying it with you when you're going to do your step nine stuff. So basically, you put together your amulet in any way you want it and wear it as you complete step nine. And whenever really you need to encounter a difficult task, especially when it's difficult for your sobriety. So yeah, that's the step nine spell. We're almost done, guys. We got three more steps. Let's go. We got number 10. Step 10 is to continue to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitting it. Now, basically, this is like a mini step four. This is kind of like a spot check into inventory where you're just going to kind of revisit the first like nine steps and making sure you absolutely got everything. Um, and step 10 is something you're going to do for the rest of your life. Um, this doesn't need to be formal with pen and paper. Sometimes you can just think it in your mind. Sometimes you could pray on it or meditate on it. But basically it helps us continuously remain true to our ideals and reminds us of our higher self, who we want to be in the future. And basically we want to clean up the dark corners and closets of our lives. Um, and it's highly suggested you do this every night prior to sleep because see, did any resentments come up today? Do I have new resentments? Did I hurt anyone today? How, why, yada, yada, yada. So by doing this every night, you can kind of get in the habit of doing it, number one. And number two, just making sure that you remain mindful and practice the 12 steps every day. Buddhist teachings advise us it is more beneficial to avoid the creation of karmic seeds than to worry about ripening karmic fruit. So we always need to continuously be mindful of our thoughts, our words, and our actions and apply the four purifying powers the moment we become aware that somehow we slipped up or harmed someone. And the ritual for step 10 is simple. It's just doing any of the rituals for steps four or seven on any character defects you miss or anybody you need to forgive or any resentments, harms, yada, yada, yada. Basically, you're just refreshing your memory kind of thing. So that was a short step, now, and now we're on step 11, where we sought through prayer, meditation, and our craft to improve our conscious contact with deity, praying for knowledge and understanding of our highest will, the divine plan for us, and the power to carry that out. Now, prayer is not a submissive act, which we must do, okay? You don't have to pray, but it is a welcome and cooperative act that helps us commune with the divine. And prayer is not a strictly Christian thing. Prayers, petitions, spells, divination, meditation, they are all basically the same because all of these are valid ways to connect with your higher power. Basically, in this step, we think praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. We're praying for the knowledge and understanding of our own highest will, the divine plan for us, and the power to carry that out. We want to come to an understanding of where our faith is positioned in the scheme of things within our own lives. So basically, you want to find a quiet place in this step and write down what it means to you to practice the religion you claim as your own. What does your spirituality require of you? 
and also in the presence of your goddesses, gods, and your higher, spell, higher self, as honestly as possible, decide how you can do better at ensuring that you do these things. I love this step because this is where my Buddhist practice can really come in because all forms of Buddhist meditation, whether contemplative, visualization, sitting, standing, walking, whatever, they fit between and encompass the two poles of meditative practice. Number one, samatha, which is also called calm abiding, and two, vipassana, which is clear seeing. Samatha is accepting the things we cannot change and also uh, developing the courage to change the things that we can as part of the serenity prayer. To practice this meditation, typically we calm our busy minds, we sit with our breath or uh, your mana beads, if you have mana beads or rosary, whatever, prayer, visual, physical things. I have a little stone angel I can hold during this that I really love to use as well. Um, you could also hold crystals, um, your spell jars, whatever. But just focus on that. So focus on your breath, focus on whatever the object is you're holding and letting your mental activity wane and return again to whatever your focus is on. So anytime your mind water wanders, just take a deep breath, let it come back and just focus on that moment. And this basically um, helps us um, you know, accepting the fact that we can't control when our mind wanders, like it happens, but we can change the things we can in the sense that we can always find ways to bring our focus back to reality. So even though our mind will wander against our will, and that's fine, we can always have something to bring us back to reality. Um, and that is developing the courage to change the things we can. In Vipassana, uh, this is a distinctively Buddhist practice. It's not very common in, in outside of like other religions and spiritualities. But basically, you're developing the insight into the nature of things, which include ourselves. And that's through focused attention. This basically encourages cultivation of the wisdom to know the difference between the things we can change and the things that we can't. Um, and so... Yeah, that's, this is basically the serenity prayer in action as a meditation, and it's really, really cool. But basically, Buddhists recognize prayer as a powerful method of meditation, and prayer is a dynamically active form of it. In Buddhism, we believe that we can improve our conscious contact with our greater power of our understanding through prayer and meditation and by leading a life that is in harmony with the Eightfold Path. And if the eightfold, eightfold Path is something new to you, well, why don't you just check out my Eightfold Path episode that I will link below for more details. Um, and hopefully uh, that'll answer some of your burning questions. Some spiritual or witchy things you can do for step 11 are one, reading the Bible, two, praying, especially the rosary, Three, going to a religious institution or shrine, if that's your thing, monastery, mosque, whatever, um, you know, whatever place you feel connected with the divine. Four, mana, med mana meditations, um, which are just amazing. I've been doing those a lot lately, and that's my way of connecting with the divine. Five, breathing exercises. And six, lighting candles for your deities. Um, and... This definitely helps. Oh, I could add divination as well. Like divination tools like pendulums, tarot cards, oracle cards, uh, osteomancy, whatever. That's another way to connect with the divine um, through a form of meditation, honestly. And finally, step 12. If you have stuck around this long, man, bless you. Like, <laughs> I don't know how you could go through, what, like an hour and a half of me talking. But uh, thank you. Um, so step 12. Having achieved a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we try to carry this message to others like ourselves and to practice these principles in all our affairs. The big theme here is giving back what was so freely given to us. So... We are going to offer here our experience, our strength, our hope, and this is to help others discover and obtain sobriety. What we gain from that experience is our own renewed hope that for one more day, we will enjoy that sobriety and someone else can as well. 
I think that the most difficult part about this step is practicing these principles in all our affairs. So you probably know from listening to me talk so much, but our addictions or compulsions have affected nearly every aspect of our lives, our relationships, our jobs, our mental health, our physical health, everything. And most facets of our lives were used at some point as an excuse or has been a trigger to whatever habit or addiction or compulsion it was that made our lives unmanageable in the first place. So to really live a sober life, we have to take these tools that we just use and build our character from scratch and working with our higher power to establish the same character in every relationship that we have. Buddhism is literally all about this step. And essentially, especially when you make a vow to be a bodhisattva, um, this is crucial. Um, if you don't remember, a bodhisattva is a being who has taken a vow to work for the liberation of all sentient beings before entering into nirvana themselves and escaping the cycle of birth, death, and suffering. Basically, the 12th step coincides with the bodhisattva vow. I vow to liberate numberless sentient beings I vow to transform endless afflictions or delusions. I vow to master innumerable practices and doctrines. I vow to embody the surpassed Buddha, unsurpassed Buddha way. The way you can tell the depth of a person's enlightenment is by the breadth of their service to others. And the big implication in this quote is, not that service to others is the test or evidence of our enlightenment, but Service itself is our path to enlightenment. Our own recovery, sobriety, and transformation are dependent on our service, not only to all suffering addicts, but to all of humanity. I mean, when you think about it, Jesus did this. Like, he healed the, the sick. He, he helped the, the poor and the sick and the people rejected by society. Um, and that's really what we're doing in the 12th step. So... Like I've mentioned in, in, in episodes about talking about Buddhism, like Jesus was a bodhisattva, like through and through. And if I, the whole point of me following him and following Yahweh and Ashra's um, path and teachings it, it is to be more like Jesus, to help not only the rich and the people high in power, but also those who don't have help, who don't have the supports they need. Um, and that really what AA has been helping me it's I want to donate money now literally anytime I check out of like uh at a grocery store they always have like do you want to donate two dollars to this and pretty much every time I do I donate and I honestly never really did that before AA um, I tried to but the anxiety of uh I I don't have money to donate or whatever but it's two dollars, right? And now I, I don't feel so stressed. I know if I keep following this path of sobriety and doing the steps, I will be okay. I'll be good financially and mentally and spiritually. I will be provided for by my higher power. So I don't have to stress about money anymore. So I don't mind giving because I will give, 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 and I'll hope that the universe provides in return. That's all I can really do to maintain faith. Other ways that I serve others, well, like I do service on my AA platform. I go to a virtual one that's on Zoom. And so they always ask for volunteers to handle like security and monitoring chats and stuff like that. And so I volunteer my time to help run meetings. Um, I typically try to do two to three hours a day, which has been really, really good for my uh, mental health. Um, also, going into the mental health field, speaking of which, my long-term goal is to help those with addictions get better health care access for physical and mental health care. Um, and this has been a really, really passionate project kind of of mine since coming to AA. Um, and yeah, I'm just super, super excited. I got accepted to a master's program. I forgot to tell you guys, I'm so happy. I'm going for master's in social work um, because clinical psychology didn't accept me yet again. But that's okay because master's in social work is still really exciting for me. Um, and I can help more people and I can serve others, serve my community um, better there. And I'm so excited for that. And I'm so blessed because I don't think I would have been able to do it if I didn't, you know, 
decide to be sober and to go through the steps and acknowledge that I was an alcoholic. Like, I don't think I would have been able to. Um, so yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm super excited to be able to help others the way my spirit team has helped me. And then finally, the, the, the third big way that I serve others is to connect with other alcoholics and building what's called the sober network and help them on their sobriety journeys. I have so many phone numbers, like half of my contacts list at this point is people I met in AA. <laughs> um, and I wouldn't have it any other way because AA has been my family. Um, I'm truly blessed and I'm truly blessed that my spirit team has brought me here. It's, it's been a journey and yeah, I'm just very happy. So excuse the sappiness. <laughs> but yeah, that's about it for this episode, guys. Um, again, if you stuck it out for like this hour and a half, I think we're at, um, thanks. <laughs> I didn't think I'm that interested to hear, um, I was questioning whether to make uh, an episode on this, honestly, but I, I think it was really therapeutic, and I, I, I like to think I'm help, I'm helping others, um, and I want to address these misconceptions because a lot of people are against AA because they don't want to deal with the whole Christian doctrine, and they don't realize that's such an insignificant part of AA. And if my episode, my podcast episode. If this episode can educate people and bring people to AA who need it, like I've, I've good. If I can bring just one person to AA with this episode, it's worth it. I don't, I don't care. And so, yeah. Um, thank you for listening. Thanks for sticking around. And for all my listeners who support me in my spiritual journey, you're, you're, you've also played a, a huge role in my sobriety. So thank you. Thank you all from the bottom of my heart. Um, but yeah, if you like this episode and you want to listen to more, um, if you're listening on YouTube, you should like, comment, and subscribe. And if you're listening on Spotify, you should give it a big follow. Um, and yeah, you can follow me also on social media. Haven't been too active these days because mental health has not been the best and focusing a lot on my sobriety, but I'm going to try to post more on, um, on my Instagram page. Uh, so Again, that's going to be in the link tree below. Give it a big follow. Um, I love to hear. I've been getting so many DMs actually lately from people like, oh, I love listening to your podcast. And I'm like, people actually listen and want to reach out to me. Thank you. But yeah, thank you all for listening because, and I love getting DMs. So if you want to DM me, don't be shy. I would love to hear from you. If you want to have a podcast idea, uh, if you have a podcast episode idea on a specific topic of interest to you, Link tree below, go to the video ideas, Google Docs, um, not Google Docs, sorry, uh, Google Forms sheet, fill it out, and I will do an episode on it. I would love to hear your suggestions. Um, and then if you want to join my Discord server, I have a Discord server for witches of all paths of life. Um, and it's, been, it's a real, real solid community. Um, and I would love to have more of you on there. So that's also going to be in the link tree below. Um, would love to have you guys join us. Uh, and yeah, that is about it for this episode. Um, thank you guys so, so much for listening. Um, oh, sorry. One more thing. Also, I'm trying to open up my business again. It's been open, but I, I haven't been advertising it as much. If you want to buy a divination reading off of me, uh, that's also going to be in the link tree below. Just go to the Goldie app and then that's how you book your appointment. And then you PayPal me your payments. Um, and that, that's, that's kind of the drill. So if you want a divination reading from me, please support my business. I'm going to have to do a lot of saving up for grad school because that tuition ain't cheap. So <laughs> your support would mean the world to me. Thank you so much. Now that is it for this episode. Thank you all for listening. Blessed be everyone. Have a wonderful day, week, month, and year.